welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the first webinar in our 2022 NSAFE Client Education Series. My name is Rich Heinzenberger. I'm a project manager here at NSAFE. And uh, today's topic is confined space emergencies, requirements for safe entry and rescue. It's being presented by Jaron Waller and Ian Davis. Jaron is a CSP and a project manager who works out of the Jackson, Mississippi office. And Ian is a process engineering specialist who splits time between the Knoxville and Blacksburg offices. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Jaron and Ian. Sounds great. Thanks, Rich, for, for the introduction and, and welcome everyone to today's you know, webinar on confined space emergencies. And, where we'll you can kind of sit down and discuss some of the requirements that we've uh, thought of as, as important tools and resources to communicate to you guys, you know, for the safe requirements for safe entry and rescue. Um, as Rich mentioned, my name is Jaron Waller, and I'm a uh, certified safety professional with NSAFE. Uh, and as far as my background in education and professional experience, uh, I have a master's degree in Homeland Security uh, with an emphasis in emergency management. I kind of took that, um, you know, educational portfolio and, and brought it to the private sector uh, where I've got 10 plus years of professional experience working with various industries, um, primarily in an industrial emergency response setting. Uh, also kind of led into, uh, which also led into uh, regulatory compliance and helping facilities uh, with their occupational health and safety and process safety efforts. Uh, and also uh, uh, aid with certain companies and their facility security measures as well. Great. Well, thanks, Jaron. Uh, hey, guys, my name's Ian Davis. I'm a bit newer to this than Jaron, and my educational background might seem like it has nothing to do with confined space rescue. And you're right, it does not. But when I'm doing this, I'm I'm in my element. Um, so I. I studied chemical engineering and Russian, strangest combination ever, I know, in school, um, both degrees from Virginia Tech, and I've been with NSAFE over a year now, primarily doing OSHA and EPA process safety management and risk management plan, um, also do some industrial hygiene work and rescue training. I've taught a couple classes with Jaron, and I am very excited for this webinar today. That's right. Yes, Ian and I are both equally excited to, to kind of present to the to the audience today. Uh, we've fortunately had the opportunity to kind of work together on a couple of training opportunities, and we we both are on the same page in regards to our passion for uh, the topic of con, uh, of confined space emergency management um, and risk management type practices. So, kind of kick things off, you know, to go over the agenda. You know, when Ian and I were initially designing the framework for this webinar. We kind of felt that you know our primary objective here was to you know, essentially introduce the audience uh, to some advanced concepts and tools to help them continue building upon the framework that we felt like they that was already existing uh, for most of our clients, right? So we we felt like you guys probably had most of the fundamentals in place. However, you know most of our goals are always to you know achieve better results and and higher results. And what we see sometimes is there may be some minor gaps uh, between each facility or each operation, uh, depending on the nature of their confined space uh, program and, and maturity level. So that's kind of the focus of today was to really sit down and kind of present some advanced tools and advanced concepts to help you guys build upon the existing framework that we felt you already have. Uh, so in order to achieve that uh, objective, we felt like the presentation should include you know, discussion topics on making sure you guys understand uh, some important reference standards and regulatory requirements that are out there uh, that govern confined space entry and rescue. Uh, we also want to talk about some of the common causes of confined space emergencies uh, within industry and the importance of rescue planning and their impacts on rescue planning. And then finally, we want to provide some guidelines and industry proven best practices for how to properly assess entrant risk. Uh, and then also how to select an appropriate rescue provider, and then ultimately how to develop a safe and effective rescue pre-plan. Okay, so moving from there, uh, if we look at some of the confined space reference standards uh, that are out there, uh, you know, to initiate a conversation concerning uh, confined space emergencies, you know, we felt that it was necessary to provide everyone uh, with an outline of the key regulations and consensus standards governing confined space entry and rescue operations. 
Uh, we also felt that it was important that you truly understand the intent behind each publication. Okay. So in doing so, one of the first things that I learned early on in my career as a practitioner is that the OSHA standards for confined space entry and rescue are mere, merely the minimum performance requirements that host employers and contractors are regulatory required to follow. So in layman's terms, the, the scope and application of these regulations uh, are essentially a mile marker for compliance purposes only, right? So they don't necessarily provide you with a roadmap for, uh, for how to get there, right? So they, they essentially just provide you know, a marker of where you have to stop. So therefore, we tend to see a commonality amongst most of our clients with mature confined space programs and that they frequently reference the consensus standards shown on the screen above, uh, such as ANSI Z17 and NFPA 350. And understanding that the benefit of these reference standards are that they provide instructions and technical insight for employers to follow um, as far as how to execute the requirements that are set forth by OSHA. So once again, OSHA establishes the mile marker for where you can stop. And then on the other hand, ANSI and NFPA provide you with a roadmap for how to get there safely. Okay. So we always thought that it was very important to uh, you know, provide everyone with the opportunity to know what these standards are, know how to potentially access them, and then know when to refer to them because the intent behind ANSI and NFPA provides really good uh, explanatory material for how to execute OSHA's um, confined space standards. Okay, so now that we've clarified some, what these reference standards are and how they work, let's briefly summarize what they say. Okay. And in doing so, my assumption is that most of you uh, are somewhat familiar with the terms such as confined space, permit required confined space, enter and attendant, so on and so forth. But what, what we're really trying to describe here is that there are similarities between both ANSI, NFPA, and OSHA standards regarding these important definitions. So for example, all three organizations agree that employers must conduct an initial confined space survey of the premise in order to establish an inventory of certain work areas or equipment, or even a combination of both sometimes that meet the following definition. Um, you know, a confined space that is, is considered to be large enough to bodily enter, has a restricted means of entry ex and exit, and it's not designed for continuous human occupancy, right? So all three parties agree on that definition. Uh, furthermore, they also agree that employers must establish a hazard identification process prior to authorizing entry into a confined space. So in these instances, employers are required to evaluate their confined space inventory and then furthermore decide whether or not each space contains or has the potential to contain one or more of the following characteristics. So does it have the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere? Uh, does it have the potential to contain material that would potentially engulf an entrant inside of the space? Uh, does it have an internal configuration that could entrap or asphyxiate an entrant through inwardly converging walls or sloped floors? Or lastly, does it contain any other rec recognized health and safety hazard, such as biological hazards, chemical hazards, mechanical hazards, or even physical other physical hazards? All right. So lastly, you know, now that we understand the definitions, you know, for confined space and for permit required confined space, and we've highlighted the fact that all three bodies agree with those definitions. One of the last things we have to think about is once you've completed the hazard identification and assessment process, and it's determined that your facility contains permit required confined spaces, the last step for controlling risk is to ensure that you provide site specific training for your entrant teams. And what I mean by entrant teams, that consists of the entrants physically entering the space. It also consists of attendants, entry supervisors, and rescue technicians as well. So basically what we're saying is that once you've determined that you have permit required confined spaces, you must provide site specific training to this team to these team members. OK, and then in, in addition to the to training, you also have to develop and implement a permit system and or entry procedures to ensure these hazards are properly eliminated and or that they're co properly controlled prior to entry authorization. And then lastly, we want to make sure that everyone understands that employers are still obligated to develop and implement procedures for summoning rescue and emergency services. Uh, so what we're going to talk about throughout most of this presentation is going to focus primarily on that last bullet point, right? So developing safe rescue pre-plans. Uh, and the reason why we want to focus on this point is because we, we feel like it's a tendency 
at most sites that we go to that this is a common weakness uh, amongst most of the um, confined space entry operations that we see. So it's pretty common that you know facilities have really good um, site specific training uh, specific to their site that they do really good risk assessments that their entry procedures are are, are are very effective at controlling the risk prior to entry. However, you know we see you know lots of um, you know common or commonly missed uh, concepts in, in regards to their ability to provide rescue if it were needed and even the ability to develop and select a rescue provider. So that's why we wanted to spend most of our time today going over this one specific topic, which is how do you control risk associated with rescue operations? Okay, so knowing that, we wanted to poll the audience uh, here in just a moment to ask the group as a whole, do personnel uh, at your site enter permit required confined spaces? And the options are no, you do not allow entry into permit required confined spaces. Yes, you have both employees and contractors that enter permit required confined spaces. Or the other option is yes, contractors only. It seems like, and this makes sense given the context of the call, that uh, we have most people with sites that have both employees and or contractors entering permit required confined spaces, um, which is yeah about, about what we expected for this call. And that underscores the importance of what we'll be continuing to talk about today in the presentation, that being the importance of rescue planning. Like Jaron said, that's what we really want to focus on predominantly is the rescue aspect of confined space programs. So starting off, let's look at some history of confined space emergencies and talk about some statistics. So if we track confined space fatalities in the US over the past several decades, we can start at a key date, 1993, and that's when OSHA issued the first permit required confined space standard. So if we flash forwards 10 years after that, we can see that the standard by from a correlation standpoint, it did good. It, it dropped 40% of confined space fatalities over 10 years. And I think most people would agree that's a step in the right direction. When we fast forward 10 more years, okay, we're still on the right track, we're dropping, but it's not nearly as significant, only a 7% drop over the next 10 years. And then when we flash forward just five years after that, we actually see an increase, a 32% increase in confined space fatalities in the US. And when you look at these statistics on a per capita basis of people in the workforce, this number remains essentially unchanged over the last 10 years. So you might be asking, OK, well, what what goes into these statistics? What can go wrong in a confined space? Well, we've sort of broken it down here by some broad categories of emergencies. Overwhelmingly, we see hazardous atmospheres leading to confined space fatalities, 76 percent. And so this could be something as as simple as a space was not properly properly air monitored beforehand and it has some sort of toxic or asphyxiating gas in it or everything was done correctly on the front end minus say a lockout tag out that leaves i don't know an inert nitrogen line hooked into your confined space and now people are in the space working and someone else inadvertently turns in the nitrogen line and now you have an asphyxiating atmosphere in the space um, engulfment also another a uh, phenomenon more scenes in the solids processing and you see it specifically in the grains industry. Um, common example is say someone's working over a confined space and not even entered in it and they're working with fall protection like they should be, but the fall protection lanyard doesn't really catch them soon enough. So they get partially or fully submerged in say grain or some other sort of solids processing and that can lead to um, crushing, crushing and or engulfment. Uh, blunt force trauma, you see this a lot with overhead work outside of confined spaces where objects can be dropped into the space, such as tools or other equipment. But also, if, if anyone's ever been inside of, say, a distillation column or, uh, you know, a mixed tank with agitators or other equipment inside, you know, it's it's really easy to ding yourself on stuff in there. I've, I've certainly come out with bruises from confined spaces myself before. As we get towards the bottom of the list, we come up on electrocution, um, which ties back largely to improper de-energizing and lockout of electrical equipment. And then lastly, we finish off with, with burns. Um, you see this more with improper hot work permitting and, and procedures used for doing hot work, such as welding in confined spaces with potential LEL atmospheres. 
But what these numbers don't show are the overwhelming majority, 90 plus percent of confined space emergencies that may not necessarily result in fatality, but are, are not exclusive to the confined space or are not due to the hazards of the confined space. These are things like heart attack or stroke, for instance, that just so happen to occur in a confined space, but may not be due to the confined space itself. But they deserve the same level of attention as these other ones because someone in that situation will likely not be able to rescue themselves. But there's even a bigger common denominator between all of these numbers here, and it's sort of a morbid statistic called the 60% statistic. So what does it say? And let this sink in here. 60% of confined space fatalities are from would-be rescuers. So what that literally means is there are more fatalities from confined space rescuers than there are from initial victims in confined spaces. And this number transcends all boundaries. It, it transcends company safety culture, program maturity, geographic location. It's a global phenomenon and it hasn't changed in the past several decades. So why? Why is this? And a lot of people have been racking their brains around this. Well, there's a concept called ethical altruism that can sort of begin to explain this. And it, it says that individuals have a moral obligation to help, serve, or benefit others even if doing so is counter to their own self-interest. And I, I think a great example is just to put yourself in the shoes of someone who sees their, say, best friend or a coworker of many years face down unconscious in a valve pit at a plant. What's your first instinct going to be? Because I, I know what mine would be. I, I'd want to jump in and save them. And I think that's what most people would say. But what if I'm not aware of the risks of that space? Well, there's a reason why he's unconscious in that valve pit, probably, and I may underestimate those risks. I may not have the knowledge and skills to attempt a safe rescue in that space, and I'm probably not planning. I'm planning this rescue. I'm I'm probably not prepared for it, but my will to rescue exceeds my sense of fear. So that human nature is kicking in and telling me that I should go. I should go do something about it. Now, as safety professionals, as, as an industry, we can tackle items one through three. We can provide better training to make people aware of confined space risks. We can provide people with the knowledge and skills to attempt, to attempt safe confined space rescue. We can better plan for rescues and prepare for emergencies. But to rewire human nature, that's a, that's a tall order. And so for that fourth item on there, what we can do as an industry is, the, is try to eliminate Eliminate the circumstance where someone would be put in a situation where their will to rescue exceeds that sense of fear because we're going to use those first three items to better prepare sites for emergencies when they happen. And so specifically at a high level, how do we do that? Um, well, Darren and I thought we'd break it down into three sort of high level points of how do you prepare for safe entry and rescue and the first being assessing the risk of the confined space and using that risk assessment to drive the response time to an emergency then selecting a provider for the rescue and evaluating their performance right ensuring that they can actually do the task that you're requiring them to and then lastly developing a pre-plan for the rescue a common theme you'll hear throughout this webinar is we don't want the first time that you're planning for an emergency to be during the emergency and we want to highlight all of this because the way that OSHA looks at an employer's compliance with the permit required confined space standard is not based on the single event outcome of a rescue. Let's say that a rescue is attempted and it's successful, all is good. But when OSHA would look at that and they would say, do you have these programmatic elements in place? Are you assessing risk? Are you determining response time? Do you have an adequate provider? Do you have pre-plans? If you have not checked those boxes, they would consider that an inadequate confined space rescue program. So we want to turn this to a question for you guys. The question is, how would you rate your company's process for comparing, for preparing for confined space entry and rescue? And we got a couple options here. Either it's very effective, little to no room for improvement, or effective, but there is room for improvement, or not effective. You know, kind of what I'm seeing so far is that, you know, it's basically, it's essentially on par with what Ian and I expected to receive in those results, right? So we, most companies that we work with uh, and consult with, 
Um, they have some of the fundamentals in place, but there are certain areas that are weaker than others. Uh, so we definitely feel like, you know, there's room for improvement in most circumstances. Um, you know, it seems like there's maybe 21% of the responders say that their process currently is not very effective. Uh, and in that case, you're not the only one. Uh, don't, don't feel surprised by that. Uh, there are lots of things that we can be doing to help you get to where you want to be. Um, some of the fundamentals don't necessarily take a lot of resources, but just, I would say, more, uh, you know, development, programmatic uh, development. Uh, putting some things in place to kind of help aid and, and controlling those risks associated with rescue planning. Um, so that being said, you know, one of the things that we want to look at uh, and, and further break it down is, is like Ian said, that there are, uh, you know, three critical activities that every uh, effective confined space program must contain. Uh, one of those key elements is the ability to assess risk and then allow that risk to determine what your response times need to be for your rescue team operations, okay? Uh, so the first activity is, like I just mentioned, it, it's the process for identifying and assessing not only entrant risk, but also a rescuer risk, right? So remember, we wanna do whatever it takes to ensure that our entry operations do not add to that would-be rescuer statistic. So by doing that, if we follow these four simple uh, workflows, we should be able to guarantee um, or essentially, you know, af effectively identify and eliminate most of the risks associated with our entry operations. Um, so, which is why we felt that it was important to provide our audience with this simple process flow uh, for performing that uh, assessment. And as you can see, the risk assessment process is, is relatively simple when you break it down in the following ways. So first, if we just simply refer back to our existing confined space inventory, or maybe even sometimes in certain situations where it's a new entry, that we have to rely on our company's procedures for determining if the space meets the definition of confined, right? So once we determine that there's confined, that we're entering a confined space, which, which essentially means that there is some elevated risk associated with that work activity, the next step is to figure out, is it a permit, are we entering a permit required confined space? Obviously, if you have a permit required confined space, the standard specifically states that you have to ha provide uh, procedures for summoning rescue and emergency services, which is why it's important to make that determination first. OK, once we determine that it, that the space you're entering is permit required, one of the things we have to think about is what hazards of that space are requiring it to be permit required and can they be eliminated uh, without entry into the space first? If so, that's great. That's what that's the the primary objective would be to eliminate all of those risks prior to entry. Uh, prior to entry, but if you can't physically do everything um, and you have some remaining hazards left, then part of your entry permit, your permitting system, should be next to figure out is this is uh, is it a simple or is it a complex rescue? And by that I mean what you're trying to figure out is if an emergency were to occur and a victim rescue would be necessary, uh, would the rescue be relatively simple simple in nature or would it require more of a complex, well thought out response, right? So the last step of this process can be a little tricky, which is why we, won't, why we want to discuss this in further detail on the next slide, which is where we'll discuss how to determine a rescue strategy, okay? So when determining a rescue strategy, uh, there are several factors that we want to consider. Uh, so first, we want to look at the internal configuration of the space, meaning is this is the space small enough for an entrant to remove themselves uh, if they were to become ill or subjected to an injury? If so, then it's pretty obvious that your rescue strategy would be would then be classified as self rescue. Uh, it's very um, there in most situations that I've seen. It's not very common to have self rescue um, spaces. Uh, most of the confined spaces that we enter into and work into are relatively large in nature, uh, but there are certain instances where self-rescue is, 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 is an option and is, is uh, something that we have to think about first before we automatically make the decision, okay? Uh, however, on the other hand, for larger spaces uh, that would prevent self-rescue, the second factor we want to consider is what type of retrieval system uh, do we have could, could we potentially utilize throughout the entry operation to ensure that each entrant uh, can safely be extracted from the space without having to physically enter the space at, uh, in hand, okay? Uh, 
So what we mean by that is say you've got a you've got your entry team on site, you've got an entry supervisor, a couple of attendants, and then you've got three or four entrants inside of the space. Uh, so there are obviously uh, some certain obviously there's some certain things we can do uh, for the attendant um, to provide non-entry rescue of those entrants inside the space. Uh, a common example of this type of rescue strategy would be the use of a tripod or a winch system or something very similar in nature. Okay. Uh, one of the things that to remember, and Ian actually um, brought this to my attention, is that 1910-146 when 1910-146 uh, specifically states that a mechanical advantage must be used at all times during a vertical entry of five feet or more. Okay, so that means anytime we go inside of a confined space with a vertical entry or a vertical hall of more than five feet, we've got to have some type of mechanical advantage system in place to be able to at least attempt a non-entry rescue of that of that entrant or of that victim, okay? And then lastly, uh, you know, when we look at what some of the more, um, you know, higher levels of risk and difficulty, one of the things we want to think about is if the internal configuration prevents us from relying on self-rescue or even non-entry rescue, then the rescue strategy at your site has to be uh, classified as entry at that point in time which is obviously, like I said, the highest level of difficulty and risk for not only just the entrant, but also for the rescuer, right? In these situations where entry rescue is required, always go back and, and refer to your risk assessment, right? Let your risk assessment drive the decision-making process to try to figure out based on what your risk rescue strategy is. Now I've got to figure out uh, what, what it would be considered an adequate rescue time needed to potentially retrieve that victim from the space. OK, so that's what we'll talk about next is how do you calculate response times and determining whether or not the risk matches your response time. OK, so this is actually one of the most common questions I receive in consulting now, and it's because it's so subjective in nature. I get asked all the time, how do you calculate response time? And then once you've just established a response time, how do I determine if, if it uh, adequately matches the risk associated with entry uh, for that specific space. So in these instances, I try to simplify the process by breaking it down, breaking it down into two components. One, you want to look at your calculations, and then second, you want to figure out is it time? Do you have a timely response or not? Okay. So first, uh, in order to calculate your actual response time, you want to look at the following elements. So if we think about reaction time, what does that mean to most of us? Well, by definition, re reaction time is the time between the entrant having a problem, requiring a rescue, and the attendant's recognition of that said problem. Okay. Then we also want to think about uh, contact time, which is defined as the time taken by an attendant to contact your rescue team. Then we also have to think about travel time. Travel time is the time taken by the rescuers to uh, physically arrive at the scene. Uh, next, we have to think about the assessment time, which is the time taken by the rescue team to size up the emergency and to determine what a safe and efficient rescue strategy would be. And then lastly, we have to think about prep time, which is the most important to me, one of the most important and crucial steps in this process, which is the time taken by the rescue team to physically set up the equipment necessary for your safe and efficient rescue. OK. And then once you have a general idea of what your response time is going to be, the next step is to determine if the response time matches the probability and or severity of the potential or known hazards within the space. OK, so if, uh, in these situations, I always try to use a process of elimination, essentially, and then I work backwards by determining what we would consider to be not timely. So, for example, you can find in OSHA's preamble in 1910-1946 that a timely response for a rescue requiring cardiopulmonary resuscitation should be no more than four minutes. So therefore, if we go through our response time calculations and we come up with 10 minutes being our response time, we can automatically assume that that's not a suitable response for a confined, any confined space entry that contains a potential or known atmospheric hazard, right? So in summary, what we wanted to explain here is that whenever you're calculating a response time and you're trying to determine if it's sufficient or not, one of the easiest things to think about is just try to envision someone lying injured, frightened and isolated at the bottom of the confined space and think about the emotional and physical stress that it puts on someone 
while they wait for every single one of the these activities to take place. And if you imagine yourself being that person at the bottom of the space, you're going to want to make sure that that there's a lot of things that are uh, that the employer has essentially done their due diligence and they're all these things are already in place and that your uh, your rescue team is is readily available to respond. Right. That's the main thing we want to show here is that we want to put forth the emphasis on making sure that our employers and, our, and the audience here today uh, is doing everything they can to reduce response time and to ensure that the risks associated with entry determine and drive that response time calculation. OK. So now we want to ask a, another question to the audience. Um, so does your facility consider entrant risk when determining when calculating response times? But it, it, once again, I mean, you guys are pretty much on par with with what we typically see throughout in, industry, right? So most of the time we, we see that, yes, there is a process in place, uh, but it's relatively informal um, and it's kind of discretionary depending upon you know who the entry supervisor is at the time that's making that decision. Or there's also other factors you know that come in place, which is, you know, is it a routine entry operation or is it kind of a somewhat of a non routine entry operation at that time? Um, so, so that's definitely something that we see, um, you know, is a commonality between um, most of our employers that we work with. Um, if the fact that some of you said no, um, not necessarily a, um, a big hindrance right this second, but I would definitely say that there are certain things that you should try to immediately incorporate into your decision making process, right? So now that I've kind of presented what those factors are and being able to calculate your response times, you know, I think it's important that, you know, you try to at least consider that in the future for most of your confined space injury operations. OK, so now that we understand, you know, how to assess risk, determine what our rescue strategy is, and then let that risk drive what our response times are. Uh, the last step of this process is using that hazard severity to drive the decision making process for determining whether or not you need on site rescue. Uh, if is on site rescue necessary or can we uh, rely on standby rescue as an acceptable means of summoning uh, rescue services at your site. OK, and we should all agree that uh, with the expectation that on site rescue should essentially be readily available whenever you have higher risk, more complex, more complex rescues at your site. OK, and what I mean by on site rescue is that it means having a trained rescue team with adequate personnel and appropriate equipment readily available at the space, ready to respond and then they can reach the victim within two to four minutes. OK, so obviously to respond this quickly, the team would need to be involved very early on in the entry operation. And they should have their equipment pre-rigged outside of the outside of the space and most of their PPE already partially donned. And what we mean by partially donned is that if you've ever been in a situation where you're trying to respond to a confined space emergency and say maybe you've got a victim down, um, you know, in a very hazardous atmosphere, uh, it, it could potentially take you two to four minutes just to don uh, your rescue harness and to potentially start to rig some of the equipment. So if all that stuff is not readily available and pre set up outside of the space, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to to reach the patient and potentially um, assess uh, the next steps uh, within two to four minutes. It's definitely uh, it's highly unlikely that a rescue team would be able to do that if they're not already on, uh, you know, right there next to the space. All right. So now that we kind of have a better understanding of what on site rescue means and when it's required. Now let's think about what it uh, what it means to have standby rescue. OK, so if we look at standby rescue as a, as a potential alternative, being that the rescue team is not on site already, that they're essentially on standby awaiting for a call if it were to be if it were to come over uh, the radio. Um, you know, this requires the team to be able to respond to the entry site in approximately 10 minutes uh, and that. Uh, OSHA essentially says they should be capable of reaching the victim in another 15 minutes later. So that's that's a 15 minutes re response time if we look at it. Uh, and in those situations, what we want to do is, you know, once again, bring up our risk assessment uh, results and let those outcomes drive 
our decision making process of whether or not we select on site rescue or if we uh, select standby. Standby rescue to me should only be used uh, if you can ensure that the response time matches the severity of the reigning hazards and that you can prove that the standby rescue provider is properly trained and adequately equipped to respond and that you properly communicated the need for potential uh, rescue and that that standby rescue provider agrees to remain on standby until further notice. So I've actually seen situations where uh, we reviewed a rescue pre-plan and they stated, you know, that they would rely on standby rescue services if and when a rescue was needed. Uh, and we, I asked the client to contact the rescue service provider. And during that time, the rescue provider had no idea that they were even entering the space that day. And they had to uh, explain to the client that they can no longer uh, provide standby rescue services because they're not properly equipped at this moment. They had a lot of high turnover, uh, so they didn't really have uh, all the personnel needed uh, to respond. So it was kind of an um, unfortunate misunderstanding um, that you know one group was relying on services that were not even capable of responding in these situations. So that's why I always say it's important to always uh, refer back to if you're going to rely on standby rescue, make sure the response time matches the severity, and then make sure that your rescue provider is properly equipped and trained and that they're that you're communicating with them on a co continuous basis and that they're readily available to respond if and when needed. OK. So the next thing we want to talk about is, you know, now that we know how to assess the risk and we know how to determine um, if and when we need rescue services, the next thing we want to look at is how to select a rescue provider and then also evaluate their performance. OK, so one of the most common mistakes that I see within confined space entry operations is how certain employers select their rescue providers. OK, in most situations, the employers do a pretty good job of meeting OSHA's intent uh, for how to select a rescue provider and how to evaluate their performance. However, the mistakes that I see commonly are when the companies are, or when companies are faced with certain non routine confined space entry operations, such as those that occur after an emergency shutdown or when the scope of work changes in a massive turnaround or even worse, maybe a certain isolation technique fails uh, to work properly. And now we're entering inside of a confined space that has a hazardous atmosphere that we don't commonly enter into when that hazard isn't properly controlled, right? So in these situations, the, the uh, complexity of the response or maybe the severity of the, of the hazard increases and we're not properly prepared uh, to have the right type of rescue, uh, the on-site rescue capabilities uh, readily available to us at that time, okay? Um, so in, in many of these circumstances, the employers are sometimes, are very susceptible to relying on their local fire department to provide rescue and emergency services. However, many fire departments are not adequately equipped and or properly trained to perform confined space rescues, and even fewer can provide standby rescue services. OK, and I'm not saying that every single fire department is incapable of providing technical confined space rescue. That's not what I'm saying at all. There are a lot of good companies out there um, that do a great job of, of you know, supporting their local community in regards to confined space rescue. However, what I'm trying to explain is that the common mistake is more um, is more on the employer end and that we have a heavy reliance on municipal support when we haven't properly prepared for a, a, this random entry operation that we're not accustomed to having, right? And when we rely on municipal support, it's very, very common to experience delayed response times or to find that there's gaps in their in the site-specific training that they've been provided or that maybe even the experience that they have in rope rescue. Um, and it ultimately, at the end of the day, what most companies are vulnerable uh, to is that the performance capabilities of the rescue provider being your, your municipal fire department that they're not um, they don't have the adequate resources to respond to your types of confined space emergencies that may occur okay um, so it's it's very important that we do whatever it takes uh, to ensure that we've got appropriate rescue providers uh, remain readily available at all times okay and in doing so one of the things that we can uh, look at uh, one of the first things that I look at uh, when trying to select a rescue provider is first, I try to explain to people uh, that what they want to do is first determine what qualifications are really needed uh, 
for the types of rescues that would be potentially performed at your site. Okay. Um, and what I mean by the competencies and qualifications are, you know, if you've got a simple, uh, you know, simple non-entry rescue operation, maybe you're not necessarily needing uh, a technical level of confined space rescue technician on site to provide that type of rescue operation. Okay. So what we're, what basically what I always fall back to is when making these decisions, I always refer to NFPA uh, 1006 and NFPA 1670, which provides the foundation for assessing rescuer competencies. Okay. NFPA 1006 establishes the competencies and skills necessary for individual performance, such as, you know, how to properly tie knots, how to rig, uh, rig, you know, mechanical advantages, how to conduct air monitoring, how to utilize, you know, descenders and ascenders um, and all the other types of confined space equipment that you would find on site. Okay. On the other hand, NFPA 1670 establishes a safe work practices and operating procedures for your confined space rescue team. All right. It's, it's a, uh, essentially your administrative side of it. Okay. And unfortunately, in each of these standards, the knowledge and skills needed for rescuers is further broken down into three levels. So we look at awareness level, which is self-rescue. Then we also look at operations level, which is non-entry rescue. And then for a technician level, you're looking at entry rescue. And once again, use your risk assessment to determine what level of training is needed for your site-specific entry operations. Okay. So now, once you've determined what level of training is needed, the next step is for you to figure out whether or not you're going to have an in-house rescue team or if you're going to rely on a third-party uh, provider. Okay. Uh, so OSHA does allow us the opportunity to select which one we want. Uh, but the intent of the OSHA standard remains the same, right? So basically, OSHA is going to say if you have a, if you select to use your in-house rescue team, that you have to train them and equip them uh, to perform rescue duties specifically for your site. And it's the same thing for a third-party rescuer. Um, if you were to hire a, a, a third-party contractor to come on site, you still have to have a verification process in place that guarantees that they're adequately equipped, they're properly trained. You get them on site and then they can physically execute a rescue, a simulated rescue at your site. So that's the main takeaway here is that um, it doesn't matter which group you use, if it's third party or in-house, um, that the intent of OSHA standard remains the same, that they have to be able to execute the same way. OK, and moving forward. We, we can look at, you know, just some uh, briefly discuss uh, some performance criteria. Uh, so once you select a rescue uh, provider, whether it's in-house or third party, you want to do an initial evaluation uh, of their uh, you know, administrative programs. Do they have all their training records in place? Do they have these you know, mutual aid agreements in place? Um, you know, do they have all the administrative support and resources they need? Right? You check all those boxes and then the last thing to do is to physically bring them on site and then simulate a response. Uh, based on the, the types of spaces they would be uh, expected to respond to. OK, so that's one of the biggest gaps that we see a lot within industry is just the, the process for selecting an emergency response service provider. OK, and then lastly, uh, one of the th last things we'll talk about uh, on my end is that once you've figured out who your rescue service provider is, make sure that you bring them on site as frequently as possible and that you train them on site. OK, so the only way to properly prepare for a confined space rescue is to practice. You have to practice. And the goal of this of this of these drills and critiques is to assure that the rescuers maintain the knowledge and skills necessary to respond safely. OK, we want to make sure that they remain operationally ready to respond. OK, and the components of a good rescue drill is essentially just a practical application and execution of what your rescue pre plans already say. OK, so one of the things you want to focus on are roles and responsibilities, communication, response times and deployment of the necessary resources. Uh, we also get frequent. I'm also frequently asked about frequency uh, and you're not going to really find this in any of the guidance documents or reference documents that we've discussed so far, but we do want to um, is a recommendation is a best practice, you know, as, as far as myself. Um, always explain to the to the clients that uh, rely on, always try to perform some type of technical rescue skill, maintain those skills on a monthly basis, whether it's tying knots, rigging the equipment, uh, 
uh, donning and doffing your PPE, try to do that on a once a month basis. OK, then you also want to look at patient assessment and packaging. That's something that's very important uh, in a, in a uh, confined space medical emergency. So I always recommend that you maintain those skills at least quarterly. OK, and then I also recommend doing a tabletop discussion at least once every six months. And with that tabletop discussion, all we're really wanting you to do is to sit down with your management team and kind of go through a workflow of how this process works from start to finish. OK, make sure everybody's on the same page. Make sure everybody understands the expectations uh, of the of groups that would be responding in these types of situations. And then lastly, uh, the one aspect of this that is regulatory required is that you do a full scale rescue annually for each type of confined space that they would be entering. OK, so that is a regulatory requirement that I want to emphasize is that if you've got three or four different spaces, uh, whether it be horizontal, vertical combination of both, your rescue team should be practicing those types of rescue operations at least annually. OK. All right. Well, thanks, Jaron. And so bundling that all together, we now come to the stage of actually developing rescue pre plans. So what goes into that? Well, we've broken it down into a couple what well, we, we think are critical elements, but to set the stage, we just want to emphasize that rescue preplans are not one size fits all. And this is really well exemplified by the pictures over here to the right. Whereas in the top picture, we see a vertical non IDLH rescue in a very tight shaft. And in the bottom picture, we see what appears to be an IDLH rescue from the face mask and escape bottle, horizontal entry into who knows what. We don't even know what's beyond there. So as you can imagine, rescue plan A does not apply to emergency B and vice versa. So what can vary between these plans? Well, first off, the communication techniques that the team uses in and out of the space, the gear that you're choosing um, to use to access the space and extricate the victim, the anchor points that you're using to anchor your gear to, any other sorts of specialized equipment that um, you know increase the accessibility or safety of the space, and then what PPE you should be going in as a rescuer to protect yourself with. And then finally, doing that patient assessment and properly packaging them to get them out of the space. Uh, these are all the things that can vary from plan to plan. And so starting off first with communication, we want to talk about some techniques inside the space and outside the space. So when you're in the space, it's imperative that when the, the rescuers first arrive, that they're trying to attempt patient contact as much as possible. You know, sometimes this isn't possible if you have someone that's unconscious or, or incommunicative, but they should be communicating with the patient as much as they can to receive status of the patient. They should be communicating between themselves and then with the people outside of the hole. Those being predominantly your attendant, entry supervisor, incident commander, and other support personnel. And there's some special considerations that should be given to these communication techniques depending on the type of the rescue. And I think the best case in point is, and I know there's people on here that have been in this before, trying to talk through an SCBA or an airline or even a typical air purifying respirator. It's hard. It's hard to talk and it's very hard to hear. So your rescue team might need something like fitted radio pieces in the face mask that amplify the noise, or they might need to learn hand signals or rope signals to communicate key information inside and outside of the space. And when it comes to those people outside the space, like your team lead or your incident commander, it's really important that they understand their role in the rescue team because we've seen it time and time again in training where the IC will get all charged up and they'll strap on an SCBA and run into the space, which you know we, we appreciate the intensity, but that's directly contributing to that 60% statistic, right? The ethical altruism is kicking in. And that's what we want to avoid with a well-trained team. Additionally, a role like a safety officer or someone to do gear checks before you're sending rescuers into a space. You know, rescuers should understand how to safely and properly don and doff their gear, but having a second set of eyes to check knots and carabiners and the integrity of anchor points is really key. And then lastly, utilizing the entrant and the attendant, even if they're not on the rescue team, because you can reap really good information from the attendant upon arriving. You know, what happened? How long they've been in there? When was the last time you heard from them? And same with the entrant, if you can communicate with them. But again, that, that's not always possible in some circumstances. So pivoting a bit to gear, the rest of the presentation is going to focus more on gear, but it's not designed to be overly technical. And so starting off with anchor points, we just want to delineate between what's good and what's not so good. So the general rule of thumb for good industrial anchors are load bearing or rated. 
So something like structural steel, reinforced concrete and large timber, I mean, those, those are load bearing types of industrial anchors that you'll find. And they're, they're supporting thousands, if you know, if not much more pounds of weight, a couple hundred extra pounds of me tying off to it probably won't do a whole lot to it. And same with the rated anchor point, as long as you're respecting the rating of that anchor point. But unfortunately, those good industrial anchors are not near as ubiquitous as you find bad industrial anchors. And it can be tempting to want to anchor off to something like a handrail because you see them everywhere, especially on elevated platforms. But in no circumstance should they be used to anchor off for a rescue or an entry because they're not rated for it. And same goes with insulated piping, fire hydrants, non-timber wood. Um, during a rescue training once, a class almost lowered me down a set of stairs, anchoring off to an AC duct. So we quickly course corrected that so I did not go slip and sliding down the stairs, right? But just want to point out what, what's good, what's not good. And the reason why we're spending time on this really at all is because anchor failure is the leading cause of rope related fatalities, both industrially and recreationally, like for rock climbers, you know, um, followed closely by improper knots. So it's really important that you get this right. And just know that more anchor points is not necessarily safer. You would never want to anchor to a good point and then, you know, just so that you feel better, a bad point as well, but it's it's kind of just a, a backup in case, you know, something happens to the good. Um, what can actually happen is if your bad anchor point fails, you can shock load the good anchor and potentially cause that to fail too. Um, so j just keep that in mind when you're picking anchor points. But largely the type of anchor that you choose is going to depend on just the space constraints outside of the confined space. So you might be lucky and have a good fixed industrial anchor like structural steel that you can anchor to outside the space. But a lot of times you won't, and so you'll have to use a mobile anchor system like a tripod or a davit arm, which can be very handy. So you got your anchor set up, now you got to put stuff on it, right? So usually the first thing you're putting up is carabiner and rope. And so we don't want to get into the weeds on this, but we do want to draw the distinction between two types of rope that you can see rescuers use, that being general use and technical use. And without getting into the weeds too much, just know that general use rope is designed to hold essentially two people, whereas technical use rope is only designed to hold one person. And this comes down to the way that it's rated from a safe working load standpoint and then a minimum breaking strength standpoint, which is its safe working load multiplied by a 15 to 1 safety factor, which may seem excessive. But if we look over to the diagram here on the right, say you have a 400 pound load on a rope and then you sus sustain a significant enough fall, you can generate enough force to actually snap a technical use rope. And this doesn't have to be, you know, a 50, 100 foot fall. This can be just a fall from wherever you're anchored to the to the length of the rope that's dangling. And so we want to emphasize that we would always recommend general use rope for rescue purposes. So you got your rope hooked up to your, your anchor point and now you got to get into the hole somehow. So how are you going to choose what you're going to go down on? Well, can we make our lives easy? Is there an existing lowering device like a winch already there that we can use? Is there some sort of obstruction in the path though that might require us to use a bit more fine control over what we're descending on? And well, I require a pickoff, which is when you have two people on the same line of rope, because a situation like that would prompt a more finely controlled descent device like a Petzl IV, say, versus a rapidly deployed device like a figure eight. And likewise, when we're going up, we got to ask the same question. Is there an existing like winch or tripod there that we can use to extract a victim out? Now, just note that winches are substantially slower in extraction than a traditionally mechanically advantage system like a three to one or a four to one. So for a hazardous atmosphere, that may not be an option for you. You know, secondly, is there a awkward haul angle you have to pull a rope at that you might have to rig additional pulleys to make the haul angle easier to pull on? And how much rope do you have? And this is a really key question that you should be asking your rescue providers, because say you have 200 feet of rope with a four to one mechanical advantage. The perk is that you are only hauling a fourth of the weight. So a 200 pound person now becomes 50 pounds. The con is that you can only use a fourth of that length of rope. So if you have a haul distance greater than 50 feet, you cannot use a pre-built four to one or any sort of four to one mechanical advantage system and you will either need more rope or a lower mechanical advantage ratio. So before you enter a space, you know, we set all this gear up before we want to send anyone in, we should check the space, maybe ventilate it depending on what the atmospheric readings come back at. And when you're checking a space, it's important to one, have the right type of gas monitor because as you know, they make different types. Two, that it has to be calibrated correctly. We, we've seen in training people do fresh air cows inside the confined space, and that's just does you no good. And three, that you're checking all levels of the space. 
And if you have to ventilate, are you exhausting? Are you blowing? Are you pulling from a clean air source? You don't want to make the space worse by ventilating, right? And then based on your air monitoring and ventilation results, that can drive what PPE selection you choose. And what I'm really going to focus on is that respiratory protection part, specifically SCBA versus airline. They both do the same function, but an SCBA obviously is more bulky, cannot fit into a lot of confined spaces, whereas your airline is much more wieldy. But a question you should ask your team is, do you have escape bottles, escape packs, if you somehow lose air? And we've done this in training before where we intentionally cut people's air and have them switch to the escape bottles. And if you know what that sensation is like with the mask getting sucked against your face, it's not fun. And then last thing to talk about with gear is patient assessment and packaging. Some questions that you can be asking depending on the type of emergency is, first off, are we dealing with an atmospheric hazard or is it physical trauma? Because that's going to largely influence how you choose to package that patient and get them out. If we're dealing with atmospheric, it's ASAP. You don't make them comfortable. You don't try to stabilize spine. You get them out as quick as you can so that they can potentially live. Um, but in a physical trauma, like a back injury, you might or you, you certainly would want to um, take your time, package them carefully and stabilize the spine. Depending on what size of the confined space opening is though, you may not be able to fit all your rescue gear into there. So that, you know, like a Stokes basket is obviously much more unwieldy than say a halfback. Um, are there any size constraints within the confined space? I've been packaged in a halfback before, not very well. And when they were trying to extract me out, they almost broke my leg coming out of the space before I had to stop them and get them to repackage me. And then lastly, how far are you from advanced medical services? Are you gonna have to potentially drag a patient a couple hundred feet to an ambulance? Because if so, you might wanna go with something like a SCED once they're out of the space to get them to the ambulance as quick as possible. So there's a lot of options here, but it all comes down to that initial patient assessment. All right, we're, we're right at time. Actually, we're a little bit over. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for attending today's webinar. Um, and hopefully you can join us for next week's webinar uh, on layers of protection analysis as it relates to process safety management. Uh, so again, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day. This concludes our presentation.